Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. Thank you all for being with me today. If you want to hit the like or subscribe button, that would help me out quite a bit. And you can also help me by leaving a review at wherever you listen to this podcast. Today we're going to talk about Odonate Therapeutics. And I'm not going to lie, I got this idea from Martin Shkreli's blog when it was up for a hot minute. He talked about how taxanes are likely to be used quite a bit in the future and that they're not you know, they're not going to go away anytime soon, even though cancer is such a big market in the biotech sector. So I wanted to look deeper into the company and see whether or not his argument had legs. And we'll get into that in a bit. And also going to touch on the news as a in the global front, as well as the biotech sector in and of itself. So not much to report personally. Been a, been a good couple weeks, a little bit of a rough go with the immune news that came off. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But the, uh, the weather's been good down here in San Diego, so I'm excited to uh, be able to go outside and not die in the hot sun. But with that, let's get into it. So the news that I want to talk about that's a little bit old now, but the Federal Reserve announced at the FOMC meeting that it will cut interest rates by 25 basis points, and it also signaled a willingness to use all of its tools to help out the economy. So it looks here, and the market kind of reacted to this, that they're going to be doing whatever they can to prop up the economy. And I know this is a big difference than what it looked like when Jerome Powell started. You know, he was very clear that it was going to be this balance sheet reduction as well as increases in interest rates. But it seems like all of that has gone out the window now. And basically, they're going to do whatever they can to make the United States economy run on all cylinders. So for me, shorting the market given this uh, is very dangerous because, you know, the Fed could announce QE quantitative easing anytime and that would likely lead to a bullishness into the market like we've seen in the last 10 years or so. So that's the Fed. The other news that came up that's been affecting the markets is that a whistleblower came out announcing that there was some shady things going on between a Trump call with the new Ukrainian president which led to a launch of an impeachment inquiry by Nancy Pelosi and their their majority Congress. Now I think this was a concern until we saw that Trump released the actual transcript of the call. And if you go through the transcript, you can see there's no actual quid pro quo that Trump is, has given the Ukrainian president. So I really do think that these concerns are overblown. The market didn't even react very much to it, and I think it's fair because the Senate is a majority Republican, and they need two-thirds uh, vote in favor of impeachment in order to actually impeach the president. So I, uh, I don't think this is going to be a concern, but... You know, as they go back and forth between Congress and Trump, we could see this affect the market in, in various ways. So that is impeachment. And then the other thing that we need to be weary of is the trade tensions, which seem to be cooling off given that China was going to come to Nebraska and visit a bunch of agricultural states. But when we announced that they confirmed their travel plans to come, the White House on Friday, the 27th, announced that they're looking into blocking Chinese companies from listing on American stock exchanges, and also that the White House is looking to prevent U.S. investor portfolio flows into China. Now, I personally think this is a great move for to protect American investors. If you've ever seen the, the documentary called The China Hustle, I really encourage you to do it because it really showcases how certain companies in China are, are just frauds, complete frauds, and the... American regulators have no jurisdiction to go in there and, and look into them to confirm that they're frauds or not. So uh, U.S. investors can get screwed that way if they're investing into these companies that have an ADR listed on the American stock exchange, but they're, they're basically non-existent entities in China, just some building with some dude. So I uh, encourage you to watch this. The other thing about this is that we could see a response from China. This obviously is not something they want, and I think it's a strange move for the White House to make before they've actually started these trade negotiations again. So the plans of the Chinese officials were to come to the U.S., and then before they actually come, the White House has announced this. So I think it's reasonable to expect that China's going to retaliate here, and they might even pull out of the meeting entirely, and this would obviously have a negative outlook on the U.S. market, even though I think long term, if the White House prevents U.S. investors from putting their money into China, obviously without China, the U.S. is one of the more attractive markets out there. So keeping that money in the United States would obviously be bullish for the U.S. stock market. But short term, if this leads to more trade escalation, we could see a, a short term decrease in the stock market for that reason. 
All right, with that, let's get to the biotech news. And to be honest, there hasn't been much going on in the last two weeks. So one thing that's been going on is the XBI has been getting crushed. It looks like it's going to close the gap from 77 to 75. We saw a close on the 27th. This is wrong. Uh, at 76.45. And there's an obvious gap here from earlier in the year that looks like it's going to get closed. Um, we've been faked out many times before, but given that the weekly close was on this 76.45, I think the, the likelihood is higher than not. It's just a matter of when. I made a little bit of money, like 50 bucks flipping XBI puts. Didn't really post about it on Twitter. Sometimes this goes so fast that I don't have time to do it. So I'll talk about that in the portfolio wrap up, but it's, uh, it's not looking very great for the sector as a whole. Other thing I wanted to touch on was that Amune sold off quite a bit on Monday. The last video I did... I, uh, I was all bushy-tailed and doughy-eyed for the gains I was going to have from Amune after the positive adcom news that we saw on Friday, two Fridays ago, but uh, the after-hours pop that we saw up to like 28 or 29 was sold off very quickly on Monday, and it went right back down to about 23 or 24. And I think the reason for this is that there's still semi-legitimate concerns about the commercial viability of the product. We know now that there's likely going to be a REMS designation for the drug. We know that there's a lot of side effect concerns with the drug. So even if it is approved and, you know, there's some kind of mass influx of deaths that occur due to anaphylaxis because of the drug, the FDA could pull it. So I think now the, the concerns have shifted more to the commercial viability rather than the, the regulatory issues, because I do think that the FDA is going to vote to approve the drug when, they, when the PDUFA day comes. So I'm going to continue to hold on to the stock until then and reevaluate afterwards. The other thing we heard this week is that Intercept filed an NDA for abeticolic acid in NASH, and this is the first drug that's been filed for a NASH indication, so very exciting there. We'll see whether or not the FDA gives any kind of priority review for them so that we can see whether or not uh, payers will start to accept it and what kind of pricing point Intercept is looking for. So that's a, that's basically it. It's been a quiet week in, in biotech, but I want to get to our main story today, which is Odonate Therapeutics. And for those who don't know, Odonate is looking into commercializing an oral taxane called Tessataxel. The company closed at $25.79 on Friday, which gives them a market cap of around $642 million. Taxanes have been around for a while, but they've only been given intravenously, and they've been used in various cancers. So the story, I encourage everyone to read about it on Wikipedia. It's a, it's a cute tale about how this compound was isolated from a specific type of tree that they found in the rainforest. And one of the funny things is that, given the demand for the drug, if they were only able to collect it from this tree, they would have to cut a substantial amount of the rainforest down just to treat cancers. So uh, thankfully, somebody came up with an artificial way to synthesize the compound. But the story, even with the drama between Bristol Myers and the government, is, is an interesting case study on uh, how drugs are developed in, in the United States. So I would definitely encourage you to read that. But basically, the compound itself disrupts microtubule polymerization. And as we know, microtubule polymerization is essential for cell division. And also, as we know, unmitigated cell division is a hallmark of cancer. So if you can stop cells from dividing, you can halt a lot of cancer. And that's basically the point of, uh, of tessataxel here. But the reason why Odonate is looking into an oral version is that IV infusion is complicated for a number of reasons. And the first above all, I think, is that having to go to a center where a nurse or some kind of caregiver um, puts the IV in and then you have to sit there for a number of hours to get the drug infused, you know, it interrupts people's daily lives. They can't just go about their business. They have to set time aside for this. And it, it's also very costly to pay for these centers to exist, to pay for the staff that has to interact with the customers. So if you can just give them a handful of pills that they can take on their own accord, sure, you worry about compliance a little bit, but it's a, it's a big alleviation of the burden that's associated with IV infusions. Another thing that makes IV infusion complicated is that the pharmacokinetics aren't ideal. And I've illustrated that here in the graph I stole from the corporate presentation of Odane. But basically, when you infuse a drug IV, you get this big increase in the serum concentration very soon. And then, you know, once you're done with the IV, after a number of hours, the concentration of the drug tapers off and you're outside of the therapeutic range. So what you want ideally is that a drug is going to maintain itself in this therapeutic range for long periods of time. And that's an advantage of an oral therapy here. 
you take the drug and it kind of slowly breaks up and it slowly dissipates and then it maintains in your system for a while. And uh, by the time you take your next dose, if you're still within therapeutic range, you're likely to get more efficacy against the disease. So that's one another reason why Odonate is looking into an oral therapy. The last big reason I see is that there's a protein that exists called P-glycoprotein 1, and it exists to efflux the current IV-infused taxanes in the brain so that it's not able to cross the blood-brain barrier and attack cancer that, that exists there. And as we know, metastases in cancer are a serious problem. And if your drug can't cross the blood-brain barrier, um, you're more likely to, to have mortality event associated with the brain metastases. So the oral version is less affected by this protein, which is obviously a huge benefit for, for patients that have metastases. So let's talk about the indications that Odonate is looking for. And the primary patient population is this HER2 negative, HR positive metastatic breast cancer. And they're doing two trials here, one that has a prior taxane therapy and one that has not had a prior taxane therapy. The other indication that they're looking for is metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And then they're also doing another trial in elderly patients. And I have to be honest, I'm not sure how this is gonna play out. Like if they're able to get a good response in these elderly patients, I'm not too sure, you know, how big this group is, so I didn't really include it in my model, but they are using their resources to look at elderly patients that have HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. To give a bit of background on these designation here, breast cancer was this confusing disease until very smart people figured out that a lot of these cancers happen to have positivity or negativity for epidermal growth factor receptor 2. And based on the type of drugs that you give them, there's a different outcome. And this is also true for HR positivity or hormone receptor positivity, which means that if it's positive, that the cancer is responsive to hormones such as estrogen or progesterone. So in these patients, you can treat them with a selective estrogen receptor antagonist, and this would stalt the cancer's growth. Companies have now focused on triaging patients based on the types of receptors the cancer expresses, and this has led to beneficial outcomes for patients this way. Now to break down the number of patients in this population here, it's estimated that there's going to be 270,000 metastatic breast cancer diagnoses in the USA in 2019, and of these, 64% uh, of them are going to be HER2 negative and HR positive, and these patients are all eligible for a type of chemotherapy, and then of the larger group that are not HER2 negative and HR positive, there's going to be about 30,000 patients who have, say, triple negative breast cancer, have some unknown type of breast cancer, or HER2 positive breast cancer. So these are also eligible for a type of chemotherapy, and these are the numbers that I used in my model. Another thing we need to consider is that there's a number of chemotherapies that are available, and what Odonate has done is surveyed a bunch of physicians, and they looked at their preferences for first-line chemotherapy treatment. And what it seems to be is that 37% of doctors are willing to use a taxane as the first-line therapy. So also in my model, I use this as a guide for the potential total market of doctors that are willing to prescribe uh, Odonate's oral taxane as opposed to, say, NAB paclitaxel, paclitaxel, or docetaxel. So let's look at the data. And what, we, what I'm showing here is the phase two data for the HER2 negative HR positive metastatic breast cancer. And what we see here is that they looked at all of the patients, so all of the patients' data is included here. 45% of them achieved a confirmed response. The median duration of response was 10.9 months, and the median progression-free survival was about 5.4 months. So this is illustrated here. We have the 45% confirmed response, 37 in stable disease, and 18% had disease progression. Now, of the confirmed response group, so just taking this column and breaking it down based on whether they had prior taxane exposure or not, uh, it didn't seem to matter. So to me, this, this illustrates that having prior taxane exposure doesn't mean that you can't still have an effect from this oral taxane therapy. So, so the market is going to be a bit bigger than we thought for the original taxane eligible patients because patients that have previously had an IV infusion of, say, NAB paclitaxel might still see a response based on the oral taxane here. I hope that makes sense. But also I wanted to look at how this compared to, say, NAB paclitaxel effectiveness. And I looked at a meta-analysis here that found that the overall response rate of NAB paclitaxel in metastatic breast cancer ranged from 33 to 54 percent, depending on the clinical trial, 
whereas some other types of taxanes range from 19% to 38%. And this overall response rate does not include patients that have stable disease, so it's really just these confirmed response or partial responding patients. So this is well within the current effectiveness of taxane therapy. So I think if, if they see a similar type of data in phase three, it's likely that the stock is going to rally on this news because of all the other benefits that I mentioned before of the oral therapy, I don't think they have to show superiority to prior taxanes, they just have to show non-inferiority. The next thing I wanted to do is compare the peak sales of all the other IV infused taxanes and use that as a guide for seeing whether or not my model was reasonable or not. And then I also wanted to look at capacitabine, which is the oral version of IV infused 5-fluorouracil. And I think this is a good case study to compare to tesotaxel here. So if we compare it to the peak sales of previous taxanes, we have Taxol, which was the original drug that was launched, and with a broad label in the year 2000, and worldwide commercialization reached $1.6 billion in sales. Abraxane, which was a newer version of Paclitaxel, which also had a broad label in 2018. In the USA, they got a peak sales of $663 million. Taxotier, another type, had a broad label in 2011, and in the USA, they had a peak sales of $827 million. Then Jevtana, which is a specific drug for prostate cancer, but it's also a taxane, in 2012 had a peak sales of $198 million. So with these, you know, we can see there's a big range in the peak sales here. Taxol is a special case because it was the first taxane and it had exclusivity as that for a while. And we also see here that three of these had very broad labels. So it didn't just include breast cancer, but it included prostate cancer and uh, lung cancer, as well as maybe pancreatic cancer. So these numbers are very inflated. And we have to keep in mind that Odonate is only looking at metastatic breast cancer. So I think what a better case to look at is this capacitabine drug, or Zolota, which was a drug by uh, Genentech. And the interesting thing about this drug is it fits the model quite well of tesotaxel because capacitabine replaced 5-fluorouracil as an oral medication. So 5-fluorouracil had to be infused just like taxanes do before tesotaxel. And what we see here is that with a broad label, so also this was not just for breast cancer, it reached a peak sales of 627 million before going generic. So I really do see that there's a cap on tesotaxel's market here if they're gonna only stay restricted to metastatic breast cancer. So the broad label of capacitabine only being 627 million, I think we need to be cautious in our optimism of Odane being a buy here. So here's how my model looked. The assumptions I made are that there's gonna be a 10,000 yearly growth in total metastatic breast cancer patients, I assumed gross margins of 85%, modest expense growth, and I think I was relatively generous here. We, uh, we don't know how expenses are going to grow necessarily in the future, especially if they're going to try to increase the indications to go from just breast cancer to, say, lung cancer or prostate cancer. The expenses that I included in my model are going to go up significantly if they are hoping to get more indications for this. Now the cost per dosing cycle, I put is $6,000, and this compares quite nicely actually to NAB paclitaxel, paclitaxel, as well as Zolota uh, before it lost exclusivity. Now, of course, this could change if the data from phase three shows that tesotaxel hits it out of the park and has much better efficacy than IV taxanes, then maybe they can garner a higher price point here, but this is what I used in my model, and I think it is comparative, and I think it is realistic to assume that. I think once they reach the maximum amount of penetration for this drug, they can assume a peak sales of $665 million, and that's assuming other competitors don't enter, assuming most doctors switch to this oral version of tesotaxel, so keep all of that in mind. And like I said, the max sales for Zolota were only $627 million, and I think Odonate is going to struggle to reach that unless they do more trials that include other types of cancer therapies. So with that, I used a discount rate of 8%, and net income decreasing by 0.1% um, until 2050, and that's after they lost exclusivity of the drug. And if anybody wants, I'm happy to share the model that I used. Write a comment below and ask for it, and if I get enough interest, I'll post it to some kind of Google Drive or something like that. But based on all of this, the net present value of the company, based on all these assumptions, is only $18. And like I mentioned, it's trading at around 25 right now, 
So my verdict here is that it's a potential short or I'm neutral and not gonna take a position here. But the reason why I'm being cautious moving forward is that there's obviously things that I could be missing here. And the things that are obvious to me are that doctors might use tesotaxel more than 37% if the data really impresses. So this original chart that I showed here, this could substantially change in the next 10 years, especially if tesotaxel shows that its effectiveness is substantially higher than the prior existing taxanes that, that have been on the market. So that's something that my model is not taking into account. The other thing is expense growth is kind of tough to estimate. We only have data from around 2017, I believe, which is when the company went public. And we see here that Q1 and Q2 growth in 2019 was around 73% and 48% respectively year over year. So this should decrease modestly moving forward. And like I said, if they're gonna increase the number of indications they want to hit that max revenue potential, there's a good chance that they're gonna to have to increase their expenses for that. The next thing I wanted to mention is that the cash run runway looks like it's gonna coincide with the 2020 phase three data release. So as of Q2 of 2019, they have about 188 million in net cash and their burn rate is around 30 million per quarter. So if you do the math and add up the quarters, it looks like in 2020 at some point they're gonna to have to raise money. And uh, this will likely coincide with positive data that comes out from the phase three trial. So after the stock moves a bunch on that news, they're gonna do an offering at that point. Now, there is some updated news that happened on the 27th that I'm gonna talk about at the end, but uh, this plays into it, so I'll get into that in a second. But the other thing is that my assumption of cost is only $6,000. Now, I am confident in this figure, but it could change, and we don't really know what their price point is gonna be. So, you know, until we see some kind of ISA report or see some kind of signaling from the company that they're gonna charge substantially more than what the going rate has been, uh, 6000 I think is reasonable. And of course, if they increase their cost here, the assumption of price per share would increase respectively. So in my opinion, I think you have a chance to short between around now and the end of 2019. And the reason for that is once 2020 hits, I think people are going to start to flow into the stock in the anticipation of positive news for their phase three data. So I might short a few shares and then cover before 2020 happens. And then once the stock pops on the phase three news, I might short again because all of this stuff that's assumed in my model is based off of a positive phase three outcome, a positive advisory committee, as well as a positive PDUFA outcome. So all of that is priced into my model. So I think that any increase in the stock, you know, to where it was maybe 45 is a, is a short for me. So to look for the upcoming catalyst, that's really the only one that we have. This phase three enrollment is going to be done in H2 of 2019, and we're told that data is going to come out in 2020. We've been given no real guidance on that, but maybe in the earnings call in Q3, which should come up in like a month or so, we'll get more guidance on that. Now, the other news that I was going to talk about regarding the, the offerings is that on the 27th, they filed an S3 with the SEC. And basically, this shelf offering gives the company an ability up to three years to offer $200 million worth of stock um, in any amount they want and any number of times they want. So it's a little confusing, but it, it gives the company the ability without as much bureaucratic tape to just do an offering whenever they want. And this can happen up to $200 million. And like I said, the market cap right now is only 600 million. So if you anticipate that within three years, they're gonna do some kind of offering up to 200 million, that could obviously dilute the stock. but I think this news on its own is probably going to lead to a decrease in the stock on Monday. And uh, unfortunately, I have not shortened, shorted any shares yet, but I'm, uh, I'm going to look to do so, I believe. So that's it for Odonate. And uh, this week, you know, we're going to look for follow-ups to the impeachment inquiry. We're going to look for follow-ups to the trade tensions. In the biotech sector specifically, I wanted to give everyone a heads up that AstraZeneca's Epinova Strength CVOT results are expected in October of 2019. And for those who don't know, this is a trial that's pretty pretty hotly anticipated, like the SEPAs. Uh, Epinova is a DHA-EPA combo pill that's looking to reduce triglycerides in, in patients. So if the news is very positive, we could see this affect Amarin in a negative way. But I think that Amarin's going to be first to market once they get that label expansion. And it's not going to be a huge problem for them just yet. Another company that I haven't spoken about in a while is Trevina, but they are set to release data in Q4 of 2019. And if you don't remember, Trevina has a, 
as a painkiller drug that the FDA wanted to see additional data for, but it was really just safety data. So I think that positive data coming out from this would lead to a boost in the stock. And unfortunately, I looked at the options chain and it's kind of weak. There's only options available for the 2.5 strike. So I might have to actually buy the, the equity itself and I don't really want to do that, but we'll see. I have some dry powder sitting, sitting on the sidelines, so I might just take uh, a stab at a few hundred shares or something like that. The last thing I wanted to mention is that Sarepta announced that they're going to present the nine-month functional data from their SRP9003 gene therapy trial, which is a treatment for limb girdle muscle, muscular dystrophy type 2E. And the reason why this is important is that Sarepta has really struggled to show any clinically significant functional data for their products. And the stock's been absolutely crushed lately. And I really do feel bad for people who've been holding on long because I, I really didn't anticipate that the stock would sell off this hard. But um, this data here could turn it all around. And on the 4th of October is when they're going to show this data. And if, if they do show a positive functional benefit of their treatment, I could really see this like bearish trend be stopped. Now, if the data is less than impressive, I don't know where the bottom is. And uh, as we know in biotech, the, the sector is very humbling and you really do need to take profits when you have them. And that's something that I'm trying to incorporate more and more into my trading here. And then finally, I just wanted to do a quick portfolio wrap up here. And basically everything has been getting killed. I, uh, I sold the call spread that lost me 70 bucks. I took a position in Iova and you know they fell afterwards so I might double down on this. I bought and sold an 80 put of the XBI that made me about 50 bucks. But basically we're still, we're struggling in the market. I, uh, I haven't sold any of the stock, I'm gonna wait it out. But I do have around six grand in dry powder sitting on the sidelines. So I'm gonna wait a little bit and see what looks like the most attractive stock to buy and uh, put some money into that. But I'm not the only one who's suffering here. We see that the XBI had a huge drop in the last week. And uh, you know the SPX and the NDX also have been getting hit pretty hard and volatility increased quite a bit given that Friday was a red day. So we'll see whether or not that resolves. But like I said, the macro events surrounding the trade tensions are gonna be the biggest thing to look forward to. Yeah, with that, I wanna thank everybody for watching. I do appreciate you all. And please like, subscribe, and leave me a review if you have the time. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to do on iTunes in particular, so it would help me out greatly if you could do that and uh, spread the word for the podcast. So I want to thank everyone one more time, and we'll see you next time.